Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part three of the Microbiome Analysis Methods lecture series. In the last couple of lectures, we talked about a few different metrics for studying microbiome diversity. We're going to wrap up this series today by talking about some of the ways that we analyze those uh, metrics to get an idea of the diversity of our samples and to gain some biological insight into microbiomes. Now, before we start talking about what we do with that data, I just want to summarize some of the um, different types of metrics that we looked at. As a reminder, there are many different microbiome diversity metrics, and they tell you different things about your microbiome samples. The first category that we um, really differentiated here was alpha diversity versus beta diversity. Remember that alpha diversity is uh, within sample diversity. And so I said uh, in the first lecture that that would be a metric that you would typically compute on one sample at a time from your feature table. That is in contrast to beta diversity, which is typically thought of as between sample diversity. And you would usually compute that on pairs of samples from your feature table. And you, in both of these cases, um, for alpha diversity, you would typically end up compare, uh, computing that on all of the samples in your feature table. Um, and that would give you a vector of alpha diversity values with one value per sample. Those values might be richness metrics, they might be evenness metrics, they might be something else. With beta diversity, we would typically end up computing that on all pairs of samples in our feature table. And so we would end up with a matrix, we typically call this a distance matrix, that would present the uh, distances or dissimilarities of pairs of samples. We looked at a quick example of a very large distance matrix at the end of class last time, and today we're going to talk about what you do with that. The next category of metrics, um, and I may not have really pointed this out while we were covering the metrics in a lot of detail, but it's worth um, talking about now that we have some experience with a few different metrics. Um, but that next category is qualitative metrics versus quantitative metrics. Qualitative metrics are ones that do not consider the count of a feature in a given sample, but rather only whether a feature is present or absent in a given sample. Present or absent would typically define, be defined by the, by the count, where a count of greater than zero is going to indicate that a feature was observed in a sample, and a count of zero is going to indicate that a feature was not observed in a sample. Quantitative metrics, on the other hand, will incorporate those counts in the diversity computation. The qualitative metrics that we talked about um, for alpha diversity was the observed features metric and the faith's phylogenetic diversity metric. We didn't talk about any quantitative uh, alpha diversity metrics, but a common one that's used is Shannon diversity. Now, in terms of beta diversity, the qualitative metrics that we discussed were Jacquard distance and unweighted unifract distance. The single quantitative metric that we discussed for beta diversity was the Bray-Curtis distance. And I also mentioned another one called weighted unifrac, which we didn't discuss. The last category I want to mention is what I refer to as phylogeny aware versus phylogeny unaware metrics. So phylogeny aware met, uh, metrics incorporate a uh, incorporate the evolutionary relationship between the features in the computation. Some of the metrics that we looked at that were phylogeny aware were faith's phylogenetic diversity and unweighted unifrac. Weighted unifrac is also a phylog uh, phylogeny aware metric. On the other hand, phylogeny unaware metrics don't incorporate relationships between features in the computation, 
Uh, and as a result, they implicitly are assuming that all of the features in your table are equally related to one another. The phylogeny unaware metrics that we talked about were observed features, um, jacquard distance, and Bray Curtis distance. Um, I may have forgotten to mention, but Faith's phylogenetic diversity, of course, is also a phylogeny aware metric. Um, now, I want to stress that one of these metric types is not always better than another metric type. And so, for example, quantitative is not necessarily always better than qualitative. Phylogeny aware is not always better than phylogeny unaware. Rather, these tell us different things about our samples. So let's now start talking about how we would interpret some alpha diversity data. And we'll focus on some Chime 2 visualizations. These are visualizations that you will run into if you're working through the Chime 2 tutorials or as you're working on the final assignment for class. And so spending some time understanding how these metrics or how these visualizations um, help us gain biological insight will help you either in your own microbiome analysis or in completing the final assignment for this class. So let's jump in and start talking about these now. The first one, we'll start with alpha diversity. Um, the first visualization that we're gonna look at is one that incorporates alpha diversity box plots and distribution comparison tests. This is generated with the alpha group significance command in the diversity plugin. And so I'm gonna go ahead and click this link. I'll probably have to resize my window a little bit. Okay, so what this, um, this plot um, I mentioned is generated with a command called alpha group significance. If you're ever wondering how a visualization uh, was generated or how some other result was generated in Chime 2, you can use the provenance tab to figure that out. I'll show you that in just a minute. Let's just spend uh, some time looking at this visualization first. So this data uh, that is being presented here is from a study that uh, was titled Moving Pictures of the Human Microbiome. And this is a small tutorial data set that is available um, via the Chime 2 documentation. Um, and so in this data set, there are data from two human subjects who donated samples from four body sites over um, in the full study. It was over the period of about 18 months. Um, in the data set that we um, have generated for the Chime 2 documentation, it's just over a couple of weeks. Um, and so what this does is it allows us to look at how the microbiome differs across sites on the human body and across these two different subjects, um, also across time. Um, and so this plot here is what I call an alpha diversity box plot. The y-axis in this plot is Faith's PD or Faith's phylogenetic diversity. And then on the x-axis, we have grouped samples in, uh, uh, into these different boxes and are representing the faith's phylogenetic diversity of these different body sites with these boxes. Um, if you haven't seen box plots before, they're a very convenient way of illustrating um, basically a five number summary of a distribution. Um, so this bottom line would typically be um, the, uh, let's look at this one actually, this one's a little bit easier to see. So this middle line here would represent the median value across all samples in this category. And so for example here, this is about 11 um, if I project across to the y-axis. Um, and so what this is telling me is that in my right palm samples, the median Faith's phylogenetic diversity value is about 11. This bottom box, or the bottom edge of the box, would typically be the um, 25th percentile. Um, and so that would be if we ranked the, um, all of the values from low to high, 
this would be the one that occurs 25% of the way through that list. That would be the 25th percentile. This top line here is typically the 75th percentile. Just to remind you, the median by definition is the 50th percentile. So it would be the number halfway through that list. Um, and then depending on how the box plot is computed, these may be the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile, um, or they may be um, somewhere around there, um, other values. If there are extreme outliers in the distribution, um, those will be shown typically with um, individual points either below or above the box. And so this is a useful way of comparing the alpha diversity across different sites in the body um, or other categories. And so what this plot tells me, for example, here, is that the left palm and the right palm are more similar to each other in their richness and their faith's phylogenetic diversity, and that the richness of these two sites are greater than that in the gut and that in the tongue. Um, that, so that's a very useful visualization, um, and we will typically want to pair that with a statistical analysis to tell us if these are statistically significant differences. The test that we use here by default is called the Kruskal-Wallis test. This is um, similar to a t-test, which you've probably learned about in your st uh, statistics class. Um, it is a variant on that that works with data that is not necessarily known to be normally distributed. Um, and so these alpha diversity values, we don't know if they're going to be normally distributed um, or if we may violate um, some other assumptions of the test. And so um, we will typically use these um, what we call non-parametric tests um, to uh, compute um, the statistical significance of these results. And so what the Kruskal-Wallis all groups test tells us is whether the mean or median of any of these distributions is significantly different from any of the others. And so if you see here, we have a p-value that is um, pretty low here. So we have um, 0 0.0005. Um, remember, we often will use an alpha of 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 to indicate whether we have a statistically significant result. Um, the, the, so by, those de by that definition, um, these would be um, probably a highly significant result. Um, now that doesn't necessarily tell us which of these groups are different from the others. Um, for that, we rely on what are known as the pairwise tests. And so here, we compare each of the individual groups using the Kruskal-Wallis test. And so, for example, this first row here is comparing the gut sample to the left palm, or sorry, the gut samples to the left palm samples. Um, and we see we do have a significant p-value here. Um, you can see we've got, um, what is that, um, three, four, five, six comparisons here, um, and we get a p-value for each one of those comparisons. Now, you may in your statistics class have talked about the issue of multiple comparisons um, and how that can impact your statistical test. Very briefly, um, remember that, um, say, a p-value of 0 0.05 indicates that you would observe a result that extreme if uh, about 1 in 20 times if there was not a signal in your data. Um, and so, in other words, um, about 1 out of every 20 times if you work with a p-value of 0 0.05, or sorry, with an alpha value of 0 0.05, one out of 20 times by definition, you should expect to get a false positive from that test. Now, that can become an issue if you're running multiple tests. And so here, for example, we ran six tests. And so we um, have a higher chance of having a false positive in there. 
um, because we have run multiple tests. And so when you do that, it is essential when you run multiple tests, it is essential that you adjust for multiple comparisons. Um, and there are a few ways to do that. We're not going to get into that in this class. Um, but those um, adjusted p-values, um, so um, a p-value following an adjustment for doing multiple comparisons, is sometimes referred to as a q-value. Um, and so that's what I'm presenting over here in this last column, is um, p-values that have been adjusted for multiple comparisons, and we refer to those um, in Chime 2 visualizations, typically as Q values. Um, and so you can see these tend to be a little bit higher. Um, you would interpret these against the same alpha value. So if you had determined that an alpha of 0 0.05 was going to be your significance threshold, you would compare your Q values to that alpha and use those to determine if you had a statistically significant result. You'll notice that in this case, um, while the Q values are higher than the P values, um, in no cases do we go from having a significant P value to having an insignificant Q value. Sometimes you will though. Um, okay, so we just looked at alpha diversity across different body sites. Um, if we come up here to the top, we can actually change this and look at some other data in here. And so what I did was I just changed the grouping of our samples so that instead of grouping by body site, we're now grouping by the subject that the, body, that the sample came from. And so now you can see I have subject one and subject two. Um, I just realized that this text might be a little bit small. I apologize for that. Um, and I will try and uh, remember to increase that in all the future visualizations that we're looking at here. Um, but subject one, subject two, um, you can see that these distributions are mostly overlapping now. Um, and if I come down here and look at my statistical tests, you can see that the p-value is 0 0.26. So taking these two bits of data together, um, the visualization and the p-value, that suggests to me that there is not a significant difference in Faith's phylogenetic diversity across the subjects in this study. On the other hand, there does seem to be a significant difference across body sites. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to my slides um, and just so I don't have to adjust my uh, window size again, I am just gonna copy paste the next link um, and I'm gonna load up uh, what's known as an alpha rarefaction plot. Um, and this one looks pretty busy, um, but let's talk really quickly about um, what this means, what an alpha rarefaction plot is. Um, first, let me just switch to that body site category again. Now, remember that in the reading and in the first lecture, we talked about the importance of comparing or computing metrics at an even sampling depth. Uh, and so in other words, having the same sampling effort across all of your samples and in a uh, sequencing based microbiome study, what that would mean is having an equal number of sequences in each one of your samples. Um, I pointed out that the way that we do that is um, most often right now using an approach called rarefaction, where we subsample from uh, we subsample counts from each one of our samples such that we will end up with the same number of sequences in each sample. Um, I describe this as um, currently being a necessary evil in these studies. Um, it is something that I hope that as a field we're starting to move away from, but it is still something that is done. Um, and so what you do, uh, so well, so one of the issues with that um, is that you are randomly sampling from your sequence data, 
Um, and what can then happen is that you can end up with some diversity metric that is telling you just about this one random sample that you collected um, rather than telling you um, something about the uh, samples in general that you're comparing. Um, and so if you got unlucky and chose a um, sample, a, uh, sam you subsampled counts and those counts were not representative of the full data that you collected for that sample, you may end up with a um, diversity value that is not very representative of um, your sample and that may not be very useful um, or may even lead you astray in analyzing your sample. An alpha diversity plot, or sorry, an alpha rarefaction plot um, will be generated by computing a diversity metric. And so I just uh, changed the metric to Faith's phylogenetic diversity. Um, and it will compute that at multiple different sequencing depths. And so in this case, you can see that we are computing Faith's phylogenetic diversity at 500. Um, at 500 sequences per sample, 1,000 sequences, 1,500 sequences per sample, 2,000, and so on. Um, additionally, at each of these depths of sequencing, we perform multiple iterations. And so we will um, do rarefaction, say, at 500 sequences per sample, 10 times, compute the alpha diversity of uh, all of the samples in each of those 10 iterations. And then we can summarize those with box plots um, along this alpha diversity plot. Um, then we'll similarly um, compute at uh, say 10 iterations at a thousand sequences per sample, compute all of the alpha diversities, and then we can present those um, in a distribution uh, that those distributions in box plots in these alpha rarefaction plots. Now, what you're typically looking for in an alpha rarefaction plot is where these values start to um, stabilize and ideally um, uh, form st uh, stably different lines from one another. Um, and so the um, body sites that I am representing here, I think I've zoomed in enough, yeah, that my legend wasn't showing. Um, but what you can see here is like I have my right palm samples, um, and those are showing up here at the top. Um, my left palm samples are these here, um, just below the right palm. Um, and then the gut and the tongue are the two down at the bottom. Um, and so what I take away from this plot um, is similar to, uh, well, similar conclusions to what I got from the alpha diversity um, box, uh, alpha diversity box plot. Um, and that is that the right and left palm, these top two lines are richer in terms of phylogenetic diversity than the gut and the tongue samples. And those gut and tongue samples have similar levels of richness to one another. Um, and so this plot um, is very useful for understanding if the depth of sequencing that you chose was a good depth. Um, so in other words, if you chose high enough. Um, the way you can tell that is by determining how stable the lines are around there. And so if you see a lot of change, like so, for example, like maybe we wouldn't want to choose something in this region because um, uh, the values are undergoing a lot of change as we increase the sequencing depth. But somewhere out here, um, we might be a bit more stable. Now, there's one other bit of complexity that I want to mention here. Um, and that, remember from the previous lectures, that I said when we choose a sequencing depth that is higher than the number of sequences that we have for some of our samples, those samples end up getting excluded from the analysis. 
Um, the plot, there's a second plot in here that shows the number of samples that are retained at each sequencing depth. And this is very important because if you start to notice some instability in your plot, that may be because you have very few samples left. And so I suspect that that's what's going on here. That's why we see so much um, this big change in Faith's phylogenetic diversity when we go from, um, say, about 900 or so sequences per sample up to about 1,400 sequences per sample in our, um, that was our ripe palm samples. Um, what happened here is we hit some threshold where we drop down to only having about three sequences remaining from those ripe palm samples. Um, and so what that means is that these averages are computed on a very small number of samples. Um, and so, um, so that tells us that like maybe out here, when we get say above maybe 1200 or so, um, that we don't really have very reliable estimates of Faith's phylogenetic diversity in our right palm samples anymore. Um, so that is the alpha rarefaction plot. Um, and I mentioned a few minutes ago that if you want to understand how these plots are generated, you want to know specifically what command generated this, um, you can look in this data provenance tab over here. Um, and so this data provenance tab um, is an interactive diagram that shows all of the steps that were run in an analysis to generate a specific Chime 2 result. The current result that we're looking at is represented by this circle at the bottom of the graph. Um, and so you can see here that this is a visualization um, that's what we were just looking at. And the box that surrounds that circle tells me what command was used to generate that visualization. Um, and so here I can see that I used a plugin um, called diversity. And I used an action in that plugin called alpha rarefaction. Uh, and so um, working back from that, you do have to know a little bit about Chang2 um, to interpret that, um, but that's the kind of thing that can be very useful if you're trying to trace back and understand what you did in an analysis, for example, to be able to reproduce that work at a later time. There's a lot of other information in here. Um, so for example, this tells you exactly how long this command took to run down to the microsecond. Um, it tells you when it ran. Um, if we scroll through here, you'll see that it tells you information about uh, what version of Chime was used to generate that or uh, to generate this result. Um, and if we click back through these boxes, we can see um, what steps were run previously leading to this data um, all the way back to when we initially imported our data into Chime 2. Um, and so I encourage you to um, spend a few minutes poking around with the, um, uh, with the data provenance in Chime 2. It's a very cool feature of the system. Um, this is all recorded for you behind the scenes without you ever knowing that it's being recorded. Um, okay, so where we left off in the last class, um, I had shown you this distance matrix. So moving on to beta diversity now, I had shown you this distance matrix and we, um, and I had mentioned how you can't really, as a human, look at this and, and get any idea of the patterns that are um, present in your data set. And so we need to do something with this distance matrix to help us interpret it. Um, there's many different things that you can do with a distance matrix. Um, and I like this figure, um, which came from a paper that is um, relatively old now. It's um, about 12, year old, 12 years old now, um, but it was a classic in the field, uh, or it, it is a classic in the field. Um, and 
I like this figure because it shows a few different ways that you can interpret a distance matrix. The first over on the left is an ordination plot, and so that's in panel A. Um, in an ordination plot, um, each sample is represented by a single point, and the points are uh, the points can be colored by information that we have about those samples. Um, and so you can see that in this plot, the um, uh, sorry, and I, I forgot to mention, this is um, almost always in microbiome research created directly from the distance matrix. And so this would be an ordination of unifract distances between samples in this case. Um, and you'll notice that panels A through D, um, the points are all laid out exactly the same. What differs across those is how the points are colored. And so you can see that the points in panel A are colored by the body site that they came from. They call that the habitat or the body habitat um, in, this, uh, in this figure. Um, in panel B, they are colored by the sex of the subject. In panel C, they're colored by the individual subject identifier. And in panel D, they're, they're colored by the day that the sample was collected. Um, and so what you can see looking at this is that there is some clear clustering patterns in panel A. Um, so for example, you see the gut and the oral cavity are clustered independently of um, most of the other sites. Uh, and so those other sites um, are from various other sites on the body, the skin, the nostril, the hair. EAC is the exterior audit, aud, auditory canal, um, basically like the, basically the ear. The, um, and those um, tend to cluster with one another. There's a little bit of difference um, between those, um, but very clearly the gut and the oral cavity stand out. Um, now, if you were to compare that, say, with panel B, um, you'll see that there, the points are now just colored um, blue for uh, male subjects, red for female subjects, and the, um, there is no solid clustering in here. So like you'll see red and blue in each of the three clusters that are showing up in those plots. And so um, here we see red and blue, here we see red and blue, and in here we see red and blue. Um, some other ways that these can be viewed um, would be doing something like um, bar charts or um, uh, box plots, which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, or you could build um, something like a what's, what's called a dendrogram. Um, and this is uh, kind of a similar idea to a phylogenetic tree, but in this case we're looking at categories of samples rather than, um, for example, um, organisms as tips of the tree. And the branch lengths in this tree are going to represent, um, a, and um, they're going to be proportional to the distances between the samples. Um, and so you can see here that the gut is the most different. It has the longest branch length to any others. Um, these samples from the mouth cluster together, so there's a relatively short branch length between them, um, but they have a longer branch length to this other group of samples, which is the skin and the ear and the nose. Um, and so these are just a few different things that you can do with a distance matrix and with sample metadata, um, so information describing where or what the source of all your different samples was. So let's look at these um, in a little bit more detail using Chime 2. Um, and so we will look at um, some visualizations of this, some interactive visualizations. Um, but a colleague of mine um, identified this figure, which I um, thought would be nice to share with you. This is 
um, an ordination plot that was, or an ordination um, diagram that was uh, uh, created in the 1950s. Um, and so you can see that this is a, a model that somebody created. It looks to me like they made it out of plywood. Um, and uh, we've come a long way since then. So we'll look at an ordination plot um, in just a minute. Okay, so first let's take a look at some box plots. Um, again, I'm just gonna copy that link. Um, if you have these slides, you can just click on those links. Um, but this is a box plot similar to what we were looking at with alpha diversity. Um, but because we are looking at pairs of samples now, um, these box plots get a little bit more complicated. Um, and so, we are again looking at these four different categories gut left palm right palm and tongue and now what these box plots are telling us is um, distances to a specific body site um, and so here for example this first plot is the distances to the gut samples and the way that i can interpret this is i can see that the distances from gut samples to other gut samples are lower than distances from left palm, right palm, or tongue to gut samples. And so what that suggests to me is that on average, the gut samples are more similar to one another than they are to any of these other body sites because distances from gut to gut are lower than left palm to gut, right palm to gut, or tongue to gut. Um, if we were to um, sort through these, keep moving through them, um, you would see that we would have a similar plot showing the distances to the left palm, um, to the right palm, and to the tongue. Now, if we look up at the top, this is um, similar to the Kruskal-Wallis all groups test. Um, this is a Permanova test that is telling us whether any of these distributions are different from the others. Um, and so we see here that we have a p-value of 0.001. And so if we had, say, an alpha threshold of 0.01, then we would say that one of these categories is significantly different from another in terms of beta diversity, and specifically as measured with unweighted unifrac. If we scroll down, we again have pairwise results. Um, these would be interpreted the same way. And so like gut and left palm, um, we have a significant p-value. Um, gut and right palm, we have a significant p-value. The one notable exception here is left palm and right palm, which are not significantly different from one another. Um, and so, you know, that probably um, make some intuitive sense to you. Um, the gut is a very different um, site from the perspective of a microorganism. Um, for one, it's anaerobic, where these other sites are aerobic. Um, and so, like, it's not surprising to see that the gut is significantly different in composition from the other three sites. The left palm and right palm, however, um, are much more similar. It's, you know, the skin on your left hand, the skin on your right hand. Um, you probably clasp your hands sometimes when you might um, swap organisms between the two of them. You do very similar things with your left and right hand. Um, they're very similar habitats. And so it may not be surprising that those um, are not significantly different from one another. Um, again, we also present the Q values here. Um, and so the Q values are the um, multiple comparisons corrected P values. Um, these box plots are similar to the bar plot that I showed in the previous slide, um, but these are, uh, they are more data rich than a bar plot. And so a box plot, um, is showing five values by default, so the 10th percentile, 25th, 50th, and uh, 90th, or sorry, 10th percentile, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile. 
Um, if instead we look at one of these bar plots, um, you can see that these only show two numbers. This is probably the mean, the top of the bar, and then I would imagine that in this case that is the standard deviation, that little um, tick on top there. Um, and so uh, I, I would um, recommend any time that you can that you're presenting box plots over, the, over bar plots because they fit in the same amount of space on your page, but the box plot is um, much more data rich. Okay, so let's next look at an ordination plot. Um, and so I'm gonna copy that link. Um, and you can see now that um, I have this ordination um, and I'm gonna start with rotating it this way. Um, and so first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna color all of these samples by body site. Um, so I get this nice menu over here on the right. I can color by subject, for example, um, but I'll go back to color by body site. Um, and what I can see here is I'm seeing some clustering of these samples. Um, so for example, I get these gut samples down here. Um, I've got these tongue samples grouping together for the most part. And then my left and right palm um, are uh, largely overlapping with one another. Um, now there's not perfect separation between these sites. Um, for example, there seems to be this right palm sample down here clustering with the gut samples. Um, we can all speculate about what might be going on there. Um, maybe we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but this is an ordination plot, again, where each point represents a single sample. Um, and we can experiment with coloring to do some exploratory data analysis. Now, this is not just a simple ordination plot. This is an ordination plot that actually um, plots two axes against, um, the, against the third axis, time. Now, we haven't really talked about what these two axes are, um, but, uh, and we don't really have time to get into that, though there is content in the book that shows how you would compute an ordination from a distance matrix. And so if you're interested in this, if you use ordination methods, I would highly recommend working through that content. Um, briefly, these um, represent the uh, similarity or differences between samples. And the idea is that you are reducing the dimension of your data set from the distance matrix, which might be, if you have 100 samples, it might be 100 by 100, um, to uh, generate values that can express the, the biggest differences between your samples in just a few axes. And so here in two axes. Um, that's pretty abstract, my description there. Um, again, I recommend you take a look at the content in the book if this is something that you're interested in. Um, okay, so the um, other axis that we have in here is time. This is days since experiments start. Um, and so this is pretty nice because we can um, just get an idea of how these samples are changing in composition over time. Um, in this data set, they're not changing all that much over time, but in cases where, for example, um, a medical treatment was given, um, these plots are often very useful because you can see um, a quick change in the microbiome data uh, if one is, um, uh, if a change results from whatever medical treatment was given. Um, now, one of the nice things about ordination plots um, is that we can color them by different points, and that lets us explore anomalies in our data. And so, for example, I mentioned this orange point over here, um, and that I wondered why it might be clustering with these other samples. Um, we have another tab in this uh, tool. It says visibility here. 
Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and set my visibility to this metadata called the reported antibiotic usage. Um, and what this lets me do is it lets me turn on or off certain samples based on metadata categories. Um, or sorry, make samples visible or not visible based on metadata categories. And so here we have this reported antibiotic usage. Um, and if I click that, I can hide the samples that arise from time points where the subject reported taking antibiotics. And when I do that, let me just toggle that, um, you can see that this point over here, this blue point, which seemed to be clustering um, strangely with like it was a skin sample clustering with the oral samples and this skin sample clustering with the gut samples. When I hide the samples that come from time points where antibiotics were taken, those two unusual data points go away. Um, and so this is a really powerful um, tool for understanding your data set because, um, for example, what this is doing is it's suggesting why we might see something strange with those samples. And so it might tell us that we want to go back and analyze our data, excluding samples where individuals had reported taking antibiotics because maybe that's going to correlate with something strange happening with our microbiome. Okay, so the last plot that I want to look at here is a plot um, that is similar to the alpha rarefaction plot that we were looking at before, um, but this is a beta rarefaction visualization that is generated with Chime 2. Um, and so this is a little bit different, um, but what the beta rarefaction functionality in Chime 2 does is it um, will perform multiple iterations at a single even sampling depth. And then it will give you an idea of the agreement across those multiple iterations. And so if I take a look at the data provenance here, um, I can see that this was um, something that I ran with the diversity plugin, the action or the action was called beta rarefaction. I did 10 iterations at a sampling depth of a thousand sequences per sample. Um, if I come back to my visualization, I can um, color these samples by body site. And what I see now is in addition to, I'm going to rotate this just so we're looking at the first two axes like we were before. Um, whoops, that is going to be these two axes. Um, what you can see is that um, in addition to our central point here, we have these little like clouds around each one of our points. And this is showing the variation um, so like the area that this point was moving around in, in our different iterations of um, rarefaction. And so when these are um, non-overlapping for the most part, um, and so like you can see like these gut samples are not overlapping with any of these other clouds, that tells you that the differences that I observed were stable across those 10 iterations at a thousand sequences per sample. Um, so that's just another way of validating that rarefaction is not, um, uh, is not uh, necessarily having a big impact on your analysis. Um, more specifically that like the rarefaction depth that you've chosen um, is not impacting the conclusion that you draw from these plots. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up there. Um, I hope this gives you some ideas for how you can use Chain 2 to understand the alpha and beta diversity metrics that we talked about in the previous lectures. Um, there is some content in the book on this as well and also in the Chain 2 documentation.
Um, okay, so I will wrap up there and I will see you next time.